This is what it's all about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is when we reach this stage where we can begin to even think about reconciliation. We're in a city that was founded by General Sanford. He was the founder of this church. He was a carpetbagger from Connecticut, Connecticut Yankee. This whole town was mixed up. You think you're in Connecticut. <laughs> this church is on a town green, Centennial Park. You know, that's where all the churches were supposed to be. You go up in Connecticut, that's the same thing. They're all town green. He was all messed up. He brought Swedes over here as the first people that were going to work his plantation. Do you know what that's like for people that are Nordic to be in this humidity and heat? That's crazy. But he founded this church before he founded this town. That says something about him. And what he did, and what he was, was the ambassador to Holland and Belgium. But his real task for Abraham Lincoln was to keep Europe out of the war, the Civil War. Because they had a vested interest in seeing that cotton get to their mills. And he was the ambassador to Europe to try to keep them from aligning themselves with the Confederacy. So we're talking about a Yankee here in Florida that founded this church before he founded that town. That's the legacy. One of the legacies he made was this painting up here. It's from an unknown artist. There's only two. One of the other ones is Smithsonian. We don't know who painted it, exact same painting. What distinguishes it is several things. One, if you could get up there, you'd have to be really tall to do that, or on a ladder, you'll see Jesus of Nazareth King of the Jews, written in the three languages that Pontius Pilate wrote it out. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. The other thing, we're sitting in a building, but Holy Cross has been destroyed three, twice before. Once by a hurricane, before they had Doppler radar. Second time by a fire. This painting survived both of those. That says something, doesn't it? That says something to me about the reconciling love of Christ that of all the things that survived, it's Him on the cross. It's Him on the cross. That's an amazing thing for us to think about. I'm proud to be the rector here. I've been the rector here for seven and a half years of the mother church of this diocese. That's no big thing, but it's historical. And when Mama says something, you listen, right? <laughs> so I hope that we will think about what it is that we need to hear in our hearts today. Because that's where reconciliation is, isn't it? It's got to be there. It can't be a mental thing. It's got to be in the heart, or it doesn't exist at all. Absalom Jones was a great man. I spent 10 years in Philadelphia. Been to the church he founded, St. Thomas's. Greg Brewer and I have known each other from that time. We both transposed Philadelphians in some ways. And that's where I knew our bishop. And the founding of St. Thomas was an important thing for the city of Philadelphia. And we celebrate a great man, a great man, who educated himself and educated others because of his education. I've been asked to speak about reconciliation, and I think when we think about the word and the action, we often think in very human terms, don't we? We think of it from our vantage point, what that means. But what is it to be reconciled with another human being? Think about it for a moment. It presumes that something has broken the bonds of affection that formerly held two people together, two groups together. 
some breach, some falling out, some sinful behavior that caused disruption and disharm disharmony in the human relationship that is in need now of repair. Perhaps repentance on both sides. And that's the hardest thing, isn't it? I'm sorry, I did this. That's the most humbling thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. To come to another human being and say, you know what, I really blew it. I did something wrong. I hurt your feelings. I hurt you, I said something wrong, I did something wrong, and I need your forgiveness. How often do we do that? It's rare, isn't it? Last time, this week, how many of you had that experience? Somebody came to you and said, I'm really sorry. I hurt you. Raise your hands. Okay, three. And yet, as Christians, we're supposed to be about the ministry of reconciliation, aren't we? It leads to forgiveness. And that ultimately leads to reconciliation. Forgiveness and reconciliation go hand in hand, don't they? One extends from the other. When I think about the concept, I often think of Samuel Clemens, the great 19th century writer that most of us know as Mark Twain. In his autobiography, Mark Twain concluded a tirade against a publisher who had swindled him outrageously on a note of forgiveness and reconciliation. He's been dead a quarter of a century now, Twain wrote. I feel only compassion for him. And if I could send him a fan, I would. Time is a great healer of some things. Some things. But God is the healer of all things. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I would like to put it on our theological hats this morning. We've had that. Boy, this has been good stuff. But I want us to think about reconciliation and what it means from God's perspective. How does God look at this? Because we look at it from a human perspective, don't we? Mm -hmm. So what does the scripture say about how God looks at this? Reconciliation in God's mind and heart concerns the atonement, the at one with mm -hmm. action of God, putting himself at the end and putting an end to enmity between us and himself and the sacrifice of his own self. God is a self-sacrificing God. Say that. God is a self-sacrificing God. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to realize that, isn't it? He is a self-sacrificing God. In the person of Jesus Christ on the cross, the very land that was slain from the foundations of the world, through Christ's actions on that cross, forgiveness is possible. Possible. And a restoration of fellowship between the strange parties, in this case, God and us, is possible and effectuated. The alienation, enmity, estrangement, that sin introduced of the human condition between God and humanity and in human relationships, because it certainly spills over, doesn't it? Was healed and dealt with by God offering himself for the sins of the whole world, mm -hmm. the sins of all humanity. In Christ's atoning sacrifice. It is out of God's unlimited love for us, each and every one of us, that God acted to restore and reconcile the breach that divides us from God. In the apocryphal writing of 3 Maccabees, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, God is easily reconciled. And the Greek word is eukatalach implying that the process of reconciliation was unproblematic for God to make. No big deal. I'm a reconciling God. 
However, we must weigh that against the New Testament stress that there was a great cost involved mm -hmm. in the reconciling sacrifice of God's own Son. Great cost. Say that. Great cost. Great cost. Great cost. We serve a poetic God. A God who out of his love for his own created beings comes down and is sacrificed to demonstrate his desire at all costs and out of all love to recapture, restore, heal, and reconcile us to himself. Reconciliation is no small matter to God. It costs him everything. He put himself on the line. Mm -hmm. It's just not about having good relations in general, but doing away with the enmity by bridging over a quarrel. It implies that the parties being reconciled are formally hostile to one another. Scripture tells us that sinners are enemies of God in Romans chapter 5.10, Colossians 1.21, and James 4.4. We should not minimize the seriousness of this breach between us and a holy, living God. God wants obedience and holiness above all things. Mm -hmm. If you haven't learned that in your walk yet, you've got a ways to go still. Mm -hmm. Obedience and holiness above all things. Am I right? Yes. Yes. An enemy is not someone who comes a little short of being a friend. He is in the other camp. He is altogether opposed to us. And the New Testament pictures God in vigorous opposition to everything that is evil in this world and in his creation. The way to overcome this enmity is to take away the cause of the poor. We may apologize with a hasty word. I'm sorry. We may pay the money that is due. Here, I owe you this. We may make what reparation or restitution that is appropriate. You know, certainly a lot more than 40 acres of you, isn't it? But in every case, the way to reconciliation lies through an effective grappling with the root cause of the enmity itself. That's the honesty that was spoken of. We've got to put it all on the table, don't we? Really look at it. Understand what we're dealing with. Christ died to put away our sin. Put away our sin. I like that. Don't you? It's, it's gone. It's, it's just put away. In this way, he dealt with the enmity between humanity and God. He put it out of the way. He made the way wide open for us to come back to God. It is this understanding that God sees true reconciliation. God was not reconciled to humanity. It was us who offended and continue to offend who need to be reconciled to God. God didn't do anything. He created us. He loved us. He doesn't need to be reconciled to us. We need to be reconciled to Him, don't we? Amen. It's our actions that are in need of reconciliation. It's our offenses to holy God that is the sin that caused His enmity in the first place. So Paul writes correctly when in 2 Corinthians he calls us to be reconciled to God. He didn't say, I hope God is reconciled to us. He said, you be reconciled to God. God demands upon humanity set up a barrier for us to be holy and upright. Humanity left on its own is content to let bygones be bygones. Aren't we? Humanity as a whole is not particularly worried about its sin. Have you noticed that? There's a callousness in the world. There's a callousness that is the root of many of the things that we see. People aren't people. You play a video game, you die, you get up again. <laughs> you can do that a thousand times in a half an hour. So what is it to kill somebody? Big deal. 
That's where we're at, isn't it? In the society, that's how sick it's gone. We're not people. You're a thing. You're something passing through my life. It isn't real. But certainly, humanity feels no hostility to God on account of sin, do they? We see that everywhere. There are people that don't have a thought of the world about God when they do something. The barrier arises from God demands upon us. And that demand is holiness. To be holy. To be like Him. Something had to take place to allow God no longer to exercise the wrath of God. Because that's what His enemies are going to feel. Right? It's still going to come. For not living up to the demands and standards of God for us to be obedient and holy. Reconciliation had to happen almost outside of humanity for it to be reconciled to God. Paul put it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let's say that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. Something had to happen outside of man before anything happened within man. Mm -hmm. He had to do something. So that as Paul can speak of Christ by whom we have now received our reconciliation. In Romans chapter 5, verse 11. A reconciliation that can be received must first be offered and accomplished. God acted first to repair that breach that we could not repair on our own. We couldn't do it. How many of you saved yourself? I could barely get out of the car nowadays, right? To save ourselves. God acted first to repair that breach. There was nothing we could do to repair it. No amount of good deeds, no amount of earning God's love in our actions. We were completely, completely, and are completely at the mercy of God's grace to effectuate that breach repair. Our sanctification, our being made holy, is the outcome of God's saving work in Christ, by which we as believers are presented to God, holy and without blemish, without reproach, as Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1. That's good news, isn't it? All the stuff we are. Does that go with you? When you leave this place and go into his life? It doesn't go with us. Thanks be to God. Paul used the noun catalog and the verb katalasso in the Greek and Romans and 2 Corinthians, and the verb apakatalasso in Colossians and Ephesians to describe and connote the estrangement between God and human beings brought to an end through Christ. I like the Koine Greek word in its imagery, apakatalasso. Makes me think of two people who have a fight or a disagreement, and one is walking away from the other, and one using a lasso, a lariat of rope, twirls it and ropes the other one in and brings them back to them. The bonds of affections are restored because one lassoed the other and brought them back. God lassoed us and brought us back. Christ was that lasso. The means for that to happen as humanity walked out of the Garden of Eden and walked away from God. It beckons us to the same enterprise and human relationships. We are called to the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians as the church. It's our task and duty before a holy and living God to lasso others and bring them back to God. Not literally, please, I don't want you to run out and get broke today. <laughs> But if that would bring somebody to Christ, maybe it would be worth it, wouldn't it? But through our proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ to them, the gospel by word and deed. As a Franciscan, I always love what St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words. <laughs> 
Jesus saw the need for us to be reconciled with one another as a precondition to true worship of God. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and then, then there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, first, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. The process of reconciliation first demands a conversion, a change of mind and heart to God before we can be in a place to reconcile with other human beings. But that is our calling too, to mirror the actions of God reconciling humanity to himself by making the first move, remembering that there may be some offense that we need to repair and heal before we approach God with a clear conscience. That's what the passing of peace is all about. In the Episcopal Church, we do that. We call it halftime. <laughs> <laughs> but what it's supposed to be about in our worship time is not a mini coffee hour in which we catch up the news with one another, <laughs> but a time that we go to make peace, heal the hurt, Acknowledge our part in the breach of some relationship. Ask forgiveness and be reconciled with that person before we come to the altar of God and receive him in the blessed sacrament. Sadly, this past century, the 20th century, ended on the same note of social disintegration, strife, racism, war, and religious persecution that characterized the whole century. And we're not doing too much better up to the year 13, are we, in this new one? Reconciliation realized in concrete acts of human forgiveness, whether between individuals or between groups, seem to be increasingly rare. We are here today in Sanford because the events of a young man's tragic death, perhaps caused by an unnecessary profiling of his ostensible suspicious actions, caused such a misunderstanding and breach that resulted in Trayvon Martin's death. The court will adjudicate with due process that case. But we clergy of this town have come to feel the prophetic hand and finger of God pointing to this case, coming down on Sanford as a people and as a nation emblematic of that and as believing Christians to understand the wrong it is to stereotype or profile or judge anyone on the outward appearance. And secondly, we need to resolve as a people, as a nation, our differences and problems without God. That's a big pressing issue, isn't it? all over this planet, but particularly in our nation here. That's the national debate right now, is it? Is that how we're gonna solve our problems? Arm everybody up. Give the janitors guns in the schools. I would want my janitor to have a gun. I knew my janitor. He would shoot me more than he'd shoot anybody else. The light of God shine down on us in Sanford as emblematic of these two crucial things that we must learn or continue to be victims to. Enter the church, the people of God. Call to a ministry of reconciliation, something we rarely do apparently, something we must learn to do, and quickly. to help God change hearts and minds into something new. Reconciliation began with God. It must be our calling as well. To God first, and then to everyone we meet.